I always wanted to make a million in a year. That was like the big thing for me. It never happened until I actually focused on the people instead of the money. What do you recommend for a new agent? What are some of the things that need to be done on a daily basis so that they can kickstart their business? Get up early, take care of yourself, and then meditate about your business and then make your calls. My calls may be prospecting new people. My calls may be following up with stuff. My calls may be past clients I need to reconnect with. You may call for sale by owners, expiring circle prospecting, buyer leads, follow up. But you need to be on that phone from 8.30 to lunch every day, unless you have an appointment. Okay, Here, here's, here's something that, that will really help you guys. Like, I want to make phone calls every day. Okay, great. Well, somebody wants to see property in the morning. Here's how you handle that. First, you try to push them off to the afternoon. That's the first thing. Hey, I have a meeting. Can we do this after lunch? Just to throw it out there to see if they're okay with that. And then you still haven't lost your phone call session. You still get to take them to see the properties. If they can't, if that's the only time they can see it, that's fine. Because the more time I waste on people, the more money I make. <coughs> I'm okay with sacrificing the phone call session to spend time with the client. Okay, but where I don't want, this is, this is, and this is where everybody gets messed up. They let that throw them off for the rest of the week. And then the next day they come in and they're thrown off and they don't get right back on track and make those calls when they turn to 12. So if it happens and you get thrown off, only let it throw you off that one day and get right back on track the next day. Okay? Don't get discouraged and upset with yourself if you, if you say, I want to make 500 calls a week and you don't hit that goal. Do not focus on the results of what you're trying to do because you'll only get disappointed. <coughs> Make the goals, strive for the goals, but focus on the day-to-day -day actions that you did everything you were supposed to do that day. And if meeting with a client is something that took you away from something else that you thought was supposed to be your goal, and now you're upset you didn't hit your goal, do not get upset with yourself. That was what you were supposed to do that day. Get right back on track the next day and keep crushing. Uh, I'm part-time uh, agent, and my time in the morning is at the W-2. So my prospecting will be in the evening, but I, yeah. my question is, between 8 and 12, yeah. who are we reaching? Because if people are working, they're working. Yeah. Can I answer, can I just like say, for real, like it does not matter what time that you call people, okay? If you watch me make calls, I'm calling in the morning, I'm calling in the afternoon, I'm talking to people, I'm doing deals. If you're gonna focus on when should I call, you're just making up excuses in your head not to call at certain times. Mm -hmm. Right? And then what happens if you miss that time? Well, I'll just wait till tomorrow because I didn't, I didn't hit that window. It's horrible mindset. Maybe people have better pickup rates between five and seven or on the weekends. Good for them. Right? I think call any time. You may have better results in other times than, than, than not, okay? But uh, I have good results any time that I call. So, uh, what do you think about door knocking? I love door knocking. I think door knocking is right up there with all the rest. Anything that puts you in front and talking voice to voice to a property owner is fire, right? But is calling more efficient? Yes, because I can call more people. You know, I'm gone walking door to door knocking. You know, by the time I knock on two doors, they weren't home and finally get somebody. I could have talked to three people on the phone right so but you're face to face so is that more valuable than on the phone so there's a lot of opinions there but to answer your question I think it's great if that's your thing if door knocking is your thing great there was a guy in Michigan Ben Steven he was in the business of selling door-to-door -door solar panels or something great great salesman he didn't want to do phone calls you know he's following my program and he doesn't want to do phone calls but he's taking my exact script and using it door knocking and crushing it then it snows. He's in Michigan. It starts snowing, right? So he's like, what am I going to do? So he's like, I guess I'm going to get on the phone since I can't go door knocking. 
And the first time he got on the phone, I, I said, I messaged him and I said, I bet you anything in the world, you'll never door knock again once you do this a couple times. And maybe three phone call sessions into it, he posted on Facebook, he was like, you're right, I'll never door knock again because you can talk to so many people so fast in today's technology driven dollar world. A lot of people have cell phones now. Yeah. And uh, people don't give their numbers the way they used to. Like you used to have to get your number published or you have to pay. How do you get access to call these numbers? I use Red X. The Red X. GeoLeads, you put in an address, it finds all the owners in that subdivision. 20, 30% of them are cell phone numbers. If you watch me on YouTube make live calls, all that is from Red X using their dialer, and you'll see that it's cell phone numbers. I'm getting people's voicemail that says, hey, this is John, call me back. That's a cell phone, okay? Um, I'll be talking to people, and we'll have a good conversation. I'll set an appointment up for lunch or something, and I'll say, and I need to know how to call them back, because now we're, now we're jogging. And I say, cool, is this your cell phone number? And they're like, yes. It's getting cell phone numbers. That's R-E-D-X.com? Go to my website, Zero to Diamond. It's there. Yo, yeah, Michelle, I know you mentioned something about investment properties and something like that. Yes, sir. As far as you doing uh, buying homes. Yeah. And fix and flips, too? I have, I don't know. I'm kind of a mess with this because I don't like count stuff. I probably have like eight or nine rental properties long term. I'm always flipping maybe five or six homes at a time. We buy them on the courthouse steps, me okay. and two other partners. We fix them up, sell them quick. So I've got, I've got properties I buy and hold, mm -hmm. which that I'll have till I die, leave to my kids. I've got properties I'll keep for a year or two and decide that's, that was my strategy. And then I have some that I turn and burn. Okay. Am I paying a higher capital gains on the ones I turn and burn? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But you do it all. You diversify yourself. Sure. Uh, program for mailing. That's an interesting topic, okay? Like direct mail. Yeah. It's interesting because the way the world is, right? Where's your money best spent? Direct mail, I think, is becoming more and more relevant as time goes on because less people are doing it because they're putting their, their money into digital. Right? It's it's becoming more and more relevant. Like as it became less relevant, it became more relevant. Right? But it's still expensive compared to other ways to reach people in today's world. Right? So it's a very interesting like dynamic. <laughs> Sorry, how you what, what I would say, like my advice would be, like as farming you mean? <coughs> Like farming a neighborhood? Yeah. I would say do a postcard or a letter every month. Mm -hmm. What did you do? I used to do every month. Mm -hmm. I spent like $3,000 a month for the longest time, right? Um, it was massive. But as time went on, I, I took a look at that and I said, this money can be, I can reach, I can reach even more people with just a fraction of that money. Okay, so now what I do with direct mail is I send a, a postcard every time I list, put something pending, or sell something to the neighborhood. That's my direct mail thing right now, okay? That's where it's evolved into. Where does it go later? I might go back to the month to month. You know, like, like, if, like if, the, uh, if the post office decides social media is really a thing, and they need to lower the uh, cost of postage, Right? They're losing money because, you know, it's a supply and demand thing, right? Maybe it becomes to where now it's it's actually worth, like, the price, you know, lines up with with the value, right? Uh, so right now in this market, pricing property correctly is super important. Uh, how do you price property? i got to see it first, right? I never, ever, ever want to price a property without seeing it. So if somebody says, you know, I want to sell this property and stuff, my first thing is, how do I see it? How do I look at it? Do I meet you? Do you live there? How do I look at it? We can't, we can't even have a conversation about it until I see it. I see a lot of agents who just try to price it based on comps, and they don't even really look at the house. Even when they go look at the house, they're not looking at it. They just show up with the comps and say, oh, this is what it is. You know, look at the house. Pay attention to the condition of the house, the location of the house. 
property, condo, lot, whatever kind of property it is. Really pay attention to it and then use the comps to your benefit based on that. Like we're in a, we're in a sliding market. Okay, last year when I, when I had to adapt, okay, when I noticed the market was flattening out, it was really easy for me to get those listings priced right because from 2012 to 2017, you could price the property 5% higher than the last sale and it would sell. And that strategy worked. It was working, 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 working until it didn't work. And last year, it quit working. Okay, so now we got sellers wanting to price it 5% higher in a market where it's slowing down and that's not going to work. So when I show up to listing agreement, I'm looking at the comps and I say, hey, look, here's, here's your next door neighbor that priced it where you want the price of that. They've been on the market for 250 days. So if you want to be on the market for 250 days and still have, have it sold, let's, let's go. Right? But if you want to sell it, you've got to realize this changing market we're in and look at days on the market, number of listings, inventory, supply, demand, how many closings, price per square foot, and this is where you go. So you, you, you use it to paint a picture of the market to the seller. And then you let them decide. If they want to price it higher, that's fine. That's what they want. And you're trying to help them get what they want. Now everybody's going to price it where you think it needs to be priced at. Do you see a new agent should look for like in a brokerage? Like what would be something that... I love that question. I think the number one thing is, is that they're going to teach you something. Mostly like how to write a contract. I think that when you're new, you have no idea what brokerage you want to go to. You have no idea anything about the game at all. So it doesn't matter. Like about your split, who cares? You haven't sold anything. Probably not going to sell anything immediately, right? The split doesn't matter as much as are they going to teach you something? Are they going to teach you something about contracts? Are they going to teach you something about how to build your business? Which they probably won't, right? But you at least got to know how to do contracts, right? And you got to you got to, just somebody that's going to help you is the main thing. And then after you get your feet wet, you, you do some deals, you get a little bit of experience and knowledge, now you can go where you want to go or renegotiate your split or whatever. You know what I mean? The split doesn't mean anything in the beginning. You can do 50 50, whatever. Right? Go somewhere where they're going to teach you something. And then once you've sold some properties and you feel like this is going to be a thing, you're not going to be statistic, you're not going to fail. And you kind of know the game a little bit. Like, you know which brokerages are good. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what's going on in your area and stuff. Then you, then you kind of can say, okay, where do I want to go? Remax is the seventh company I've been with because the biggest reason why so many is because the market, when the market crashed, they kind of swirled around to a couple just to stay alive. Um, but uh, I knew it was where I wanted to be in the end. Uh, so, but it took me a while to, to, to get there. So you can always leave whoever you, you go with. You can always leave them any time. So don't be scared or think you got to pick the perfect one first. I got a question for you, but I'll turn it to Denise. How come you don't open your own office? I, I want nothing to do with, with owning an office of liability, of dealing with agents, right? Like, when I started the team, the reason I didn't like that is because I was spending more time, the time with the agents were taken away from time with my clients, and it was just killing me. I love the clients part of it. I want to be in the game. I don't want to be on the sidelines, you know? And to me, I feel like I'm happier, like, like, like mentally, like, like financially. Like I feel like I'm in a better place as a single agent working for a big brand than I would if I had my own company or was a broker or a team leader. Hi, I just want to ask, do you have a st strategic method of reaching clients that are in default? Because I'm finding that they're in denial and they're going to let it out yeah. to respond. If you want to go after those people, just call them and say, hey, I see that you're in default. Is there anything in the world I can do for you? And see where the conversation goes. The thing is, is that you don't have to limit yourself to that. Call every property owner in the area 
and say, what? Let's do something. I'm here, you're here, we're two humans, let's do something. All right? I want to help you. If you want to go after the pre foreclosures, go after them. But don't make it like a how do I do it thing. I told you what to do. Everything is what the world can do for you. And let it open up. And then when they get to a part where they want to do something, why do you want to do it? And then help them do accomplish that. What's the best thing about being a millionaire and um, it's money? Wait, who, who is asking this question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Golly. Best thing about being a millionaire and what? And it's money, your main motivation in your business. No, absolutely not. The money means nothing. I wouldn't be here if money meant something. It cost me money to be here. If I cared about money, I would have tried to charge and I wouldn't have been here. Right? Um, the thing about being a millionaire is it doesn't mean anything. Once you get, like, I always wanted to make a million in a year. That was like the big thing for me. It never happened until I actually focused on the people instead of the money. Okay? But once you get there, you realize what you thought was the top was a mirage. <laughs> this doesn't mean anything. This isn't even close. This is, I'm still at the bottom of the mountain. You, you, you just thought you climbed the mountain, and you did. But, but it turned out to be a little molehill. Once you get there, you turn around and see there's the, you, the industry is this big, and we're microscopic dots. I'd like for you to say the pitch that you say when you uh, do your co Because it's real easy to know someone I really want to. And you can get it, it's free, it's on my website. But I say, hey, this is Ricky Cruz, Riggs of Orange Beach. How are you doing today? Let's role play. Ring, ring, ring. Hello? Hey, Miss Johnson? Is this Miss Johnson? Yes, it is. Hey, this is Ricky Cruz with Remix of Orange Beach. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Ricky? I'm doing good. I'm enjoying the day. Isn't it gorgeous out here? It's fantastic. Great. Well, look, I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but a house around the corner just sold. I was just going to call and see if there's anything in the world I could do for you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your call. I think I need a, uh, I'd like to know what my house is for. It's, and how much do that house around the corner sell for? I got you. It's sold for X amount, and I'll be glad to help you with finding out what your house is worth. Let me ask you something real quick. If you were to actually sell it, is there an agent that you would work with? No, I can't. I, I, I've been living in my home for the last 25 years. Great. Well, look, at some point when you sell it, I'm happy to work with you. Um, I'm going to stay in touch with you. Let me send you that CMA. What is your email address? Thank you so much. Bye. Um, I have a question for you. It's it's about the mindset as well as the work habit, right? I I'm, I'm, I have the mindset, I have the work habit, but disconnecting is I have a lot of trouble doing. Like my time is three forty-five in the morning, ten a.m. I'm at ten p.m. And that's it, and then like a machine. But my kids are are a little older, and they're like, Dad, you have to disconnect. You know, sometimes or when we're talking, they're like. Hey, Dad, come back, you know, so that's where I'm having trouble disconnecting. What, uh, when's your, when's your, do you have designated family time? I do. When is that? It's normally the movies or dinner. Right. You know, things like that. Six o'clock. On the weekends. Yeah, not during the weekday. Yeah. It's hard, right? Yep. Like, our phones are so, there's so much going on on our phones. Right. There's phone calls, texts, emails five or six social media platforms, um, you know, whatever platform you use to process your deals, you got just so much going on there. And any minute that you're away from it, you feel like it's just gonna pile up on you for later, and it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. I like a book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, right? It's an incredible book. And one of the big key points I got out of it was that I never read it because it was called the four hour work week and it sounds like this scammy kind of thing, like you don't have to work, you can be lazy. It's nothing like that, it's the real deal. But it's about 
It's about compounding your time and giving yourself more time to do other things like spend with your family. And one thing that he does is he doesn't check his email but like twice a day. He lets it pile up and then he checks it um, and then he takes care of all of it, you know, in a good little, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute, you know, time block. You got a time block. And if you, if you, like, if, if you, if you're going to have family time at 6 o'clock, okay, if that's your designated time, it's going to be 6 o'clock on the dock, you're going to have dinner, you're going to go to the movies with your kids and stuff, I would say from 5 to 6, or if it's 5 o'clock, from 4 to 5, that needs to be your decompression time where you totally focus on getting all that out of your system. Look at your phone and, and, and answer all the stuff and call everybody, right? And, then, and that's your decompression time. You got to do that for your family so that you can give them all of you when it's family time. Get all that out of your system. That way, at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, you can literally almost turn your phone off. Guys, I appreciate y'all having me and stuff. guys need anything in the world reach out to me like email me text me call me message me whatever just hit me up that's what I do I respond to every single message that's what I do.